So thank you all for coming. I really appreciate the opportunity to um, come down and talk with y'all and um, get to learn a little bit more about what y'all do. Like we said, I, I came in August from Mississippi State and I had been there for about eight years and um, doing a lot of research on coastal issues and hydrology and water quality. Um, I'm an engineer and I'm a modeler. I'm not an ecologist, um, but I really, really love to work with ecologists and biologists um, because the data that ecologists and biologists collect can really be helpful in feeding the models that I work with and um, can help ecologists use the data in ways that they wouldn't maybe normally use the data. So I'm looking for collaborators and I'm looking for people to work with. Here's some of the people that I have worked with on the projects that I'm going to be presenting. Um, my funding has mostly come through NOAA, um, but then also some state funding through DEQ, Department of Environmental Quality, Department of Marine Resources, Go Mesa, the Gulf of Mexico Energy Security Act, Northern Gulf Institute, like I work, like Ruth mentioned, I used to be associate director over there, um, and some more store funding. So I'm going to talk about really just hydrodynamic and water quality modeling. So these are mechanistic kind of physics-based models. And I'm gonna talk about two models. Um, one is located in the Mississippi Sound in Mobile Bay and one is Biscayne Bay in Florida. So we'll start closer to home and then go over to Florida. Um, this is the Mississippi Sound model. This is how it was developed initially. So it's changed since then, but this was the initial um, study domain. And so the blue right here is the model domain for the sound model. And then we also did a Pearl River model that linked together. So Mississippi Sound and Pearl River models linked together. These are three dimensional models. They simulate hydrodynamics, currents, flow, uh, water surface elevation, temperature, salinity. And then they also have a water quality component where we can simulate nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus. We can simulate dissolved oxygen and algae. Um, this is a little bit of model calibration just to show you how well the model does at simulating realistic results. So here the red is measured water surface elevation and the blue is simulated water surface elevation. This one here is station 28. So that's located right here. This is um, Bay St. Louis right here. This is a lot where a lot of Mississippi oysters, commercial oysters are right here at Merrill Shell. And so this is that site um, in the winter, spring, summer, and fall. And you can see the tidal oscillations going back and forth as the water goes up and down with the tides. And you can see that the model is pretty well able to simulate that. Um, another um, validation of the model, looking at how well it does, uh, this is station 25. So that's up here kind of near the Pearl River. And this is temperature. Again, measured temperature in red and modeled temperature in blue. So we do a really good job of simulating temperature. Water surface elevation and temperature are the two easiest things to simulate. When you get to salinity and water quality, it gets a little bit more difficult. So this is actually salinity at station 28, so back over here. And so you can see, this is the measured, sometimes we have gaps in our data and this is our simulated. And so we're not matching nearly as well as we did with water surface elevation, but we, we hit the trends, we hit some of the peaks, we hit some of the seasonal trends with salinity. Um, and then moving on from salinity, to more of the water quality. Now water quality is harder because we've got gauges out there um, measuring salinity, temperature, time series, like every 15 minutes, we've got USGS gauges measuring uh, water surface elevation and temperature um, and conductivity. So we can get those salinity measurements pretty easily. Monitoring data for nutrients is a little bit harder to come by. So for example, here is some of the total organic phosphorus is the red, and here is phosphate, the measurements in red. And so you can get you know, a couple measurements here and there, but not nearly that nice time series of data that we can get with the salinity and the water temperature and water surface elevation. 
but we still do our best to calibrate the model and have the model results match the measured results as well as we can. Um, and then from there, we use those nutrients, grow algae, and the algae respire and affect dissolved oxygen. And so we were lucky enough to have quite a few dissolved oxygen monitoring gauges. These are the gauges that are measuring dissolved oxygen. These are all mostly Louisiana gauges. And so the red are measured dissolved oxygen and the blue is modeled dissolved oxygen. And so you can definitely see, this is year down here. So going from 2011 to 2018, you can see the seasonal trend where dissolved oxygen goes up in the winter because the water is colder and it can just hold more oxygen and goes down in the summer when the water is hotter and it can hold less oxygen. So we capture those seasonal trends pretty well. Um, so since this was all done while I was at Mississippi State, so since I have moved to Alabama, I wanted to expand my spatial domain and expand where I'm simulating over to the Alabama side. And I figured while I was doing that, let's simulate Lake Pontchartrain too. So we expanded it over to the east and the west. Um, and now this is the entire spatial domain. So we're going all the way up into Mobile Bay. We got this dredge channel showing up. This is elevation, this is bathymetry. So the bluer the color, the deeper the water, the redder the color, the higher the water, or the higher the elevation. So some of these reds are actually out of the water. So just like the previous model, it simulates currents, water surface elevation, salinity temperature, still working on getting nutrients, dissolved oxygen and algae for you know, these new portions. Um, it runs from 2009 to 2020. So that's about 11 years of data. And it takes about 16 hours to run those 11 years of data. And once we add water quality, it'll probably double or triple the amount of time. So we're looking at over a day to run the simulation. Um, so we're looking at putting it up on the high performance computing cluster at, at Auburn. And we're running that right now. We're just still working out some of the bugs that. Um, these are the boundary conditions. So what makes this model run? What forces the, the model? And that is the boundary conditions. So we have rivers flowing in, supplying fresh water. And along with that fresh water, you have a temperature, um, you have pretty much zero salinity associated with it, but you also have nutrient loading and everything like that. So we've got about 18 fresh water sources right, all the way from Lake Pontchartrain, Pearl River, Pascagoula, and Mobile are the big freshwater systems with Mobile being really the biggest. And then out here on the sound side, we have open boundary conditions that are open to the tidal currents. So these are where we have surface water elevation that's basically pushing water into the model or pulling water out of the model uh, based on those tidal currents. So I just want to show you a little bit about how the model looks like when it runs. So this is the model running. This is actually the graphical user interface that we have, that I have, that I run the model on. These are velocity vectors. So this is what it looks like when it's running. And the longer the, these are arrows, the longer the arrow, the faster the water is flowing in or out. The redder the arrow, the faster the water is flowing in or out. And then the direction of the arrow is the direction of the water flow. Um, so you can see, yeah. in some locations, these arrows are actually switching direction with the tide because the tide goes in and then the tide goes out. Um, and I think the next one I have is a zoomed in version of that. Yeah, so here's right here, um, it's off an island. And you can see those velocity vectors kind of switching back and forth with the tide as the water goes in and out on the daily cycle. And you can see water is moving much more slowly over here on the Eastern portion of the bay and faster um, kind of nearer the opening. 
got a couple more videos just to show you some other perspectives. So this one is salinity. So we've got salinity and you can see the salinity pulsing in and out um, of the bay and along the um, boundary conditions, the daily salinity um, patterns. So the bluer the water, the fresher the water, the greener or redder, greener or yellower or redder, the more salty water. And I think as this kind of keeps going, it hits a little bit of a saltier part. We might see some orange coming in and out. Um, but you can see these patterns of salinity, right? Where you have flow kind of coming out here and you get kind of like these circular um, patterns of salinity. And I think I have one more. This one is a little bit different, um, but what we also do, what we can also do, we can, we can simulate the salinity, um, the nutrients and all that kind of stuff, but we can also simulate particles moving um, through the boundary. And so this one, if you can see at the very beginning, hold on, let me pause it and put it back to the beginning. Yeah. Now, see, Okay, if you start the simulation, we start with a gridded um, pattern of these red dots, and they're just distributed evenly throughout the model domain. And then it, this is Lagrangian particle tracking, so it's going to move those particles with the currents um, in the water. So we can actually track where particles will move. Um, and you can see that they're kind of flowing out of the system and flowing this way. You can see kind of like that circular pattern and they actually eventually leave the system. So we can track um, all sorts of different things. We can track larvae, we can track um, sediments, all sorts of different things with the Lagrangian particle tracking. Okay. So now that we expanded the mesh, um, again, we did some more calibration to make sure that our model results match the measured results with the new mesh. And so you can see um, this is water surface elevation. We had a big storm come through. Um, and so we were able to catch the high events as well as kind of the daily tidal oscillations. When you look at the graph over the entire period of simulation, it just looks like a bunch of mishmash, just some crazy lines. That's why you kind of have to zoom in on specific times to be able to really see how well you're doing. So this is St. Joe, which is right here. And again, we got salinity. The modeled is in blue and the measured is in red. Salinity is harder to do, um, but you can see the seasonal trends kind of tracking um, with the modeled versus the measured. But it's just, it's just a lot harder to, to simulate salinity than it is to simulate the water surface elevation or the temperature. So that's how the model works. Why do we care? Why do we have this model? What do we use it for? Um, so this is a graphic of some of the things going on in the Mississippi Sound and Mobile Bay. And granted, I am from Mississippi. I've only been here for less than a year. I'm learning about Alabama. So most of the issues that I'm familiar with come from the Mississippi side. And that's part of the reason I'm here is to find out what you guys are interested in on the Alabama side. The huge thing that we're dealing with in Mississippi is the Bonnet Carey Spillway opening. Who's heard of the Bonnet Carey Spillway? Okay, everybody knows about Bonnet Carey Spillway. So um, this is Bonnet Carey right here when the Mississippi River is about to flood New Orleans. In order to prevent New Orleans from flooding, we open up, it's about a mile and a half wide of a spillway. And that water flows through Lake Pontchartrain into the Wrigley's in the Mississippi Sound. In 2019, they opened it twice and it killed pretty much all of Mississippi's commercial oysters. Um, and so the Bonnet Carey Spillway was built back in 1939 and it used to be open like once every five years or 10 years and just over time, it's opening more and more often. And the reason when they open it is it's congressionally mandated, it's a law. It says when the water level gets this high, the law says open the spillway. There's really no science that has gone into it. And I think now we're beginning to turn the tide where it used to be, well, it's a law, we can't change that. It's just what we gotta deal with. Now scientists say, well, maybe we should change that law. 
maybe we should reconsider how we open the spillway. I mean, obviously we can't flood New Orleans, but is there a better science-based reason for how we open it, how long we open it, how much we open it at a time? Um, because it does have really important impacts on the, the sound. Another thing going on in this area is we're sediment starved. And so we're constantly re-nourishing um, our beaches and our barrier islands. And so that's gonna affect how currents flow, how the salinity regime and all that kind of stuff. Um, another thing that's going on in Mississippi is the Pearl River. There's the East Pearl River and the West Pearl River. And so water has been diverted um, between the East and the West Pearl River. And then how does that affect flows? So these are some of the management questions um, going on um, that we can use this model to um, help with. So hydrodynamic models and water quality models are really useful for these management type questions because it simulates over space and time, right? If you're out in the field collecting data, you might hit this spot one day and hit this spot another day and hit this spot another day. But the model is able to like simulate and bring those points together through space and time because um, it's able to simulate throughout the parametric space um, over time. And then because it's not a statistical model, it's a physics-based model, we can simulate experiments like management scenarios. So we could say, okay, well, what if we didn't open the Bonnet Carey spill bit? Or what if we opened it halfway for twice as long? So we can simulate those large scale experiments that are just impossible to simulate on the ground. Um, and we can simulate sea level rise, we can simulate changes in precipitation, all that sort of thing too. Um, so three of the big projects that I'm working on right now with this model is simulating those bonnet carry spillway operations, looking at oyster restoration, and also threats to dolphin health, because those spillway openings have been shown to increase dolphin mortality. So I'll talk a little bit about each of these projects quickly. Okay, so this is a project where we use the model to develop an oyster habitat suitability um, model in the Mississippi Sound. So this was based on the old mesh, right? So these points here are the commercial reefs that are open in Mississippi. And so this was like our presence data. We're like assuming this is presence, and so this is where oysters like to live. So can we take that along with the model outputs and project where else oysters might like to live so we can site new restoration reefs? Um, I put it, should have put this slide earlier, but um, this is Mississippi oyster landings over time. So this one's 1880 to 2015 or something like that. And so this is oops, millions of pounds of meat, right? And it's up and down, it's up and down. Um, and then this graph is 1999 to 2018. And you can see the Mississippi commercial oyster landing industry just crashing. So it was a $60 million a year industry and basically we have no oysters in Mississippi anymore, um, trying to come back from that. Um, and so we use this Maxent habitat suitability model. Now this is a statistical model. This is the only model I'll talk to the, about today that is not a mechanistic model. It's a purely statistic based model. And what you do is you take your species occurrence data. So that's like, where are our oysters? Where are they living? Where are they happy? And you overlay that with spatially and temporally dynamic, it can be spatial and temporal, environmental factors like maps of salinity or maps of temperature or depth or dissolved oxygen. So you overlay those and the maxent, what it does is says, okay, well this, these oysters, we're experiencing this kind of temperature, this kind of dissolved oxygen, this kind of salinity. And so anywhere else that has those, anywhere else in my spatial domain that has those characteristics, it's probably gonna be another good place for oysters. Um, and so the inputs that we put into the model are depth, salinity, temperature, and dissolved oxygen. And again, the model is able to simulate temperature throughout the spatial domain salinity throughout the spatial domain. So that's able, enables us to have the actual map of habitat suitability throughout the area. 
And these are the outputs from the model. So this is habitat suitability for, I guess we got eight oyster years. So the 2009 slash 2010 oyster year, all the way to the 2016 slash 2017 oyster year. So red is a one. So that's really good oyster habitat suitability. That's where the oysters are projected to thrive. Um, blue is zero, really bad oyster habitat suitability where we would expect oysters to not survive. And what's interesting is how this map changes over the years, right? So the same habitat suitability right here is different. And you can go back and figure out what this came from. Was there a salinity event? Was there a storm? You know, that sort of thing and track that back. But it's dynamic. It shows how that habitat suitability changes over time. And then you can take an average because one number is much more easy to understand than a whole bunch of numbers. So this is the map of the average habitat suitability throughout that model domain. Um, again, blue is going to be high habitat suitability. Um, red is going to be low. And so what we did is we gave this, this was specifically Department of Marine Resources in, in Mississippi specifically asked for this map because they're trying to figure out where should they site their oyster reef restoration. And so we give them a map and say, this is where we think you should site it. Um, and they can use that along with other information to site their site, site their restoration activities. So now moving from oysters to dolphins, um, these, this is the NOAA database of dolphin stranding, um, showing dolphins um, where um, dead dolphins have washed the shore. And so they're usually washing ashore on beaches. So we don't find the dolphins where they actually died. We find them where they washed ashore. And so one of the questions is, is what was the salinity or what were in the environmental factors, not where they were found, but where they died. And so we're using this model to try to get at that. Um, but before I even talk about that, just some statistical relationships. So this graph down here is cumulative, red is cumulative dolphin mortalities in the Mississippi Sound. The gray is salinity in the sound. And the yellow is bonnet carry spillway openings. So we had a bonnet carry spillway opening here in 2011, one in 2016, one in 2018, two in 2019. Look at this big spike with dolphin mortalities, right coinciding with those two bonnet carry spillway openings. Um, and here is a simple regression model. I mean, it's very simple, as simple as you can get regression, where we have measure or we model the strandings using the only only bonnet carry spillway openings to to predict how many dolphin strandings we're going to have in a year and using that as the only variable to predict how many dolphin strandings you're going to get in a year you get this relationship between measured and model strandings you get almost a 0.9 um, r squared between modeled and measured um, dolphin strandings. Now you can see this line, this trend line doesn't go through zero because even on good years, you're gonna have dolphins die, right? But when you have those bonnet carry spillway openings happening, you have more dolphins dying. Um, and then you can get into principal component analysis and look at that. And here it gets a lot more complicated, um, but basically the gray circles um, are dolphin deaths right after a bonnet carry spillway opening. The white circles are dolphin deaths during the bonnet carry spillway openings, and the black cir circles are dolphin deaths not during bonnet carry spillway openings. So you can see this pretty significant cluster over here showing that there is something going on with dolphin mortality during bonnet carry spillway openings. And here we've got wind, uh, water surface elevation and conductivity. So what we are doing is we're using, go back. to so the Lagrangian particle tracking. So we're gonna use this model 
to hind half and figure out those dolphins that dive, where did they originate from? We know where they, where they were washed ashore and we can estimate about how long it's been since their death. So we can just basically backtrack to figure out where those dolphins were when they actually died and what was the salinity like at the time of their death. So now I'm going to move away from Alabama and into Florida to Biscayne Bay. Um, so this is Biscayne Bay right here, and this is Miami. So Biscayne Bay's watershed is Miami. And Biscayne Bay is an oligotrophic, crystal clear blue tourism spot. Right, blue waters, crystal clear waters. You got kite surfing, people going to the beach, seagrasses, fishing, all sorts of things that rely on this really beautiful crystal clear oligotrophic system. But its watershed is Miami. So there's obviously a lot of disruption um, and nutrients and things coming in from that watershed. Um, and so we are using a hydrodynamic same hydrodynamic and water quality model to try to understand what um, management practices we need to, um, to do to keep Biscayne Bay the way it is. Because there is some early signs of, I wouldn't say eutrophication, but increased nutrients. There have been some algae blooms. Um, there is signs of increased nutrients. And so what we don't wanna do is hit that tipping point where it something like Chesapeake Bay happens, right? And you just lose all that value um, of, of the ecosystem services that it's presenting. So we can, we can try to simulate that with the model. Um, <clears throat> with this one, we're not just using the hydrodynamic model, but we're linking the hydrodynamic model to HSPS, which is a watershed model. So this is kind of a graphic of what HSPF simulates. It's like SWAT, if anybody knows SWAT. So it simulates rain falling on the land. There's surface runoff, there's um, runoff through the soil, it's picking up nutrients, and then that flow is entering the stream. So the watershed model simulates how wa watershed management practices influence um, flow and water quality in the stream. So, this is one of the watersheds we're focusing on. This is Coral Gables Waterway. And um, the thing about um, Biscayne Bay, it is so flat. This is a topographic map of, um, of Biscayne Bay. And you can see the roads showing up as major kind of delimiters for, for flow because like, flow is not gonna necessarily go downhill in such a flat area. Sometimes it's gonna go with the stormwater drains or the directions of the roads. So that's one of the challenges with this area is that it's so flat to try to simulate where the water's flowing. The other challenge in this area is it's karst. So it's a karst geology. So it's limestone, um, which has got a lot of holes in it. And so if you've got a whole bunch of holes in your geology, you're gonna have a bunch of preferential flow that's unmapped. So we don't know where that groundwater is flowing. And there can be groundwater rivers that flow and, and mapping those is really hard. So those are the two big challenges in this area is that it's flat and that it's got a karst geography, geology. So this is the Biscayne Bay EFDC hydrodynamic water quality model. Here, this one is 3D. So we've got a surface layer and a bottom layer, right? and then you've got your horizontal cells. So it is simulating in three dimensions. Uh, it's almost 10,000 cells and then times two because you got a top layer and a bottom layer. So that's almost 20,000 cells. The cells are about 300 meters by 300 meters. Um, just like for the Mississippi Sound model, we're simulating currents, flow, water surface elevation, salinity, nutrients, dissolved oxygen and chlorophyll A. This one, again, is a multi-year simulation. It's going from 2012 to about 2020. Um, this one takes about four days to run, so a little bit more time to run than the other model. And the reason this one takes longer is because it's three-dimensional. So you got those two 
two layers. Um, again, I just like to show the movies so you guys can see what the actual model looks like. So these are the velocity vectors. Um, there's a pretty big opening here between um, Biscayne Bay and the Atlantic Ocean. And that's largely what's kept it so oligotrophic for so long. I mean, the solution to pollution is dilution. You know, that's, we don't say that, but <laughs> this is actually a case where it kind of helps the fact that there's a lot of flow between the Atlantic Ocean and, uh, and Miami. So you do get that washing out of nutrients. Um, So those are the velocity vectors. I've also got a movie of salinity. And here you can see um, salinity. The scale here is from zero. It actually gets hypersaline in some locations. So it goes up to 40 um, parts per thousand. Um, and you can see the daily um, flux of salinity in and out of the system. And you can actually see this is Coral Gables. So we are simulating salinity and water quality and nutrients in one of the canals. None of these, um, none of the rivers that flow into this area are natural. They're all man-made canals. Um, and so when we zoom in, a, when it zooms in again a little bit, you can see the salinity going in and out of Coral Gables as well. Yeah, so you can see the fresh water up here and you do get the salinity signal going in. And th this is a loop, so it's kind of interesting how it flows around the loop. Um, so one of the big things that um, is going on in Biscayne Bay is, I mean, they're worried about nutrients, but they're also really worried about um, um, salinity because you guys have heard anything about the Everglades and how it used to be a very wet area in South Florida. And then in order to develop it, we basically had to take all that fresh water and shunt it out to the ocean, right? So we dried up a lot of the, the area and now we're trying to kind of wet it back up again. And so there's this constant balance. We, we want more fresh water coming in and we're directing more fresh water into Biscayne Bay through restoration activities. And so how is that gonna impact um, the bay? Um, just to show you, I think it's always nice to show the model data and the measured data, um, just so you can have an idea of how well the model's working. Let me go back up to presenter mode. So here we got hourly, daily, and monthly. Um, this is salinity. So model is in red and blue is observed. So this is how it matches hourly. And then you can average that to your daily and you can see how it matches on your daily time scale. And then you can average that up to the monthly time scale and see how that matches. Um, you can see here R squared is 0.5 on your hourly. 0.25 on your daily and 0.56 on your monthly. So the R squared kind of goes up and down all over the place. Um, but in general, usually what you see is it's a better match when you average over a month. Um, this is at a near shore site over here. This is the hardest areas for us to actually simulate salinity is in these near shore areas because there's a lot of groundwater inflow um, and contributions that we really don't understand. I mean, we don't know the groundwater processes and how they flow. We're coming up with a, we're developing, we're trying to get at it two different ways. We're developing a mod flow mechanistic model of groundwater flow. And we're also doing some machine learning to try to understand the differences between salinity with just the model and then the measured salinity. And maybe the difference between the two is what groundwater is. Um, so we're trying to get at groundwater, but basically, Point is, is that these nearshore environments are really hard to get at salinity because it's such a karst, such a holy um, area with all that fresh water coming in. 
A lot of times in Florida, people actually talk about, you know, we talk about watersheds here all the time. In Florida, sometimes people talk about spring sheds because the aquifer is so dominant. And um, it's not just about the water flow off the top of the land, it's also about the aquifer and the spring shed that combines that. Um, here's another site, more up in the northern portion of the bay, looking at salinity again, hourly, daily, and monthly. Um, here, our trends are a little bit different. We get an R squared of 0.35, R squared of 0.37, and then when you go up to monthly, you get an R squared of 0.70, which is quite a bit better. And we have some preliminary um, water quality simulations in Biscayne Bay. Water quality is the hardest one to do. It's even harder than salinity, mostly because, well, it's a more complex system because you got biology going in. And then there's less data because it, you can't just put a salinity. A, it's a lot harder to put a nitrogen probe out than it is to put a salinity probe out that needs the water all the time. And so this is nitrate over here, ammonia over here, and phosphate over here. With the redder, the higher the nutrients, the bluer, the lower the nutrients. In general, we have more nutrients up in the northern portion of the bay because that's more confined, less um, exchange between the ocean. And also, if you go back up to the map, up here is where the big center of Miami is. It gets a little bit more agricultural down here, and it's mostly like Everglades and wetlands down in the south, right? So most of the city is up here in the northern portion. So in general, we have higher nutrients, but down here we got higher levels of nitrate in the south. Um, and then we're also using the model to um, simulate changes in sea level rise and how the sea level rise might affect salinity in the bay. Um, people are very concerned about salinity in the same bay um, because they are doing so many water management, engineering kind of movement of water. You gotta keep the dry land dry for the people, but then we're just trying to also keep the ecosystems healthy and trying to balance that is really, really challenging. And then you um, climate change and sea level rise comes in and any solution you come up with has got to be changed because everything's going to change because climate change and sea level rise. So here's four different models of um, sea level rise. So we got the um, surging seas, we got the NOAA sea level rise viewer, we've got Florida sea level rise scenarios, and then we've got our Biscayne Bay model. The great thing about this model and running sea level rise scenarios is most sea level rise models, I used to work with SLAM. Anybody heard of SLAM before? It's a sea level rise model, but it's basically just a bathtub model. It says, if the water is gonna go up, I'm just gonna raise the elevation of the water and anything underwater is gonna be wet. The hydrodynamic model is more complex because it actually simulates those currents. And you can actually flood or dry out areas differently because of your current flow. Um, and so you get a much more nuanced view of how sea level rise is going to occur using a hydrodynamic model. Um, so that's everything that I have. Um, like I said, I'm really thankful for you guys for hosting me for today. It's been great to come down here. I've actually been down to Dolphin Island a couple times, but just for family fun, not for work. We um, have a camper and we come, last two Christmases we've stayed in the RV park. Um, and my kids really love biking and going to the beach and all that sort of thing. And, and I actually grew up in Chesapeake Bay. Um, so coastal issues are near and dear to my heart. Um, but I am a modeler and I'm, like I said at the beginning, I'm really looking for ecologists and biologists and laboratory people and fieldwork people to collaborate with because sometimes you guys can find new ways to use your data. We can plug in your data to my model or my data to yours. Um, either way to um, try to understand those temporal and spatial trends in water quality. So thank you guys.
you, that's a good point. Um, so as far as wind goes, yes, we have wind as a forcing in the model. So it does push the wind um, is input over the top of the mesh. And so it can push the water in the direction of the wind. You can also have wind driven waves, which neither of these models have that module set up, but you can do wind driven waves as well. Uh, but we're not simulating those. So one of the problems with the wind is also where you're getting your data from, because there's only so many wind monitoring stations. Um, so, um, but anyways, we do have wind. As far as the sugarcane um, and the agricultural Everglades agricultural area, that's a good point. That's not something we've looked at so far. Um, right now, the model domain has one canal in it. The rest of the canals are just represented as point sources of flow and nutrients, but we are not running the watershed models like we're running for Coral Gables. But this is a project that's been going on for about six years, and hopefully we're going to get another five years of funding. And yeah, so that that's some, something that we are planning on doing is extending the model to simulate additional watersheds instead of just having it as a point source. Thank you. Yeah. So great model, I really like it. And I had a question about the particle tracking. Are you able to change the behavior of the particles depending on the conditions of the model? So for example, a lot of these larvae will settle down during uh, low tide or high tide, and then when their tide is switching back to the direction they want to go, they'll go back up into the water column. So are you able to have them like stop moving during one point of the model and then one tidal regime and then back to move it again at another tidal regime? Yeah, so you can do a lot of different things with the particles. We can say they have different buoyancy. So some can float and some, you can just define the buoyancy of the particle. Um, you can define the, sh the size and the shape of the particle as well. Um, so like when we're talking about dolphins, they're gonna be a lot bigger than oyster larvae, you're gonna be a lot smaller. Right now, the um, Mississippi Sound model is just two dimensional. It's not three dimensional. So there is no top and bottom, there's just one. But really, it's a click of the mouse to turn it into a three-dimensional model. So we could simulate that. Um, it's not something we're simulating right now, but it's something that would be really interesting to do. Other question? Yeah. You said that uh, the factory spillway is congressionally mandated to open, right? Are you? Is there any movement to use like your model or something like it to? change how we manage it or? That's a political minefield, but yes. Um, one of our projects is specifically looking at that. Okay. And um, what I'm doing is that, just like I, what I said before is I am saying, well, what if we didn't open the spillway? How would salinities change? Because oftentimes the spillway opens when you got a lot of rain anyways. Um, you know, the Mississippi River is huge. But sometimes, like the Pearl River is flooding at the same time they open the spillway. So you have those two sources of fresh water. So you can't blame the spillway on everything all the time, <laughs> even though we want to. Um, so in order to look at that, we can close the spillway and open it. Um, and, and we're also, like I said, we're opening it like half as much and twice as long. One of the problems that we're finding, one of the things I'm dealing with right now is these boundary conditions right here. So these are the measured boundary conditions. The spillway, you get fresh water all the way down here when the spillway opens. And so my boundary conditions, I can't turn off the spillway opening if my boundary conditions measured the spillway opening, right? So if I have fresh water down here as my boundary condition and I turn off the spillway, fresh water is still there. It's like a legacy thing. So I'm trying to figure out right now how to modify these boundary conditions to be able to represent that better. So that's one of the challenges. I mean, we're actually, one of the next iterations is to bring the model, whoops, down further south, the mesh down further south um, to represent it a little bit better. Uh, so comparing the two domains, like uh, Midway and uh, Florida, which one was more challenging for you? I mean, 
One is more carbon, 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 you know, you have much more nutrients in the Mississippi Sound, and so there's um, your buffer of uncertainty can be a little bit wider. So the temperature. Yeah, I didn't just show that, but yes, we do some. We do temperature. Yeah, yeah. So that makes things grow faster in the summer, and it affects dissolved oxygen saturation and all that sort of thing. But definitely Biscayne Bay is harder nutrient-wise because it is an oligotrophic system. Okay. Well, thank you guys very much. I appreciate your time and your questions.